I am James Nadumparam. I am an Associate Professor of Law and the Executive Director for the Center for International Trade and Economic Laws at General Global Law School. I will be speaking about the concept of dumping in international trade and the purpose and scope of the anti-dumping agreement under the World Trade Organization. Dumping is used to refer to a situation where a firm sells its product at a price less than its home market price. Can it be called unfair competition? Of course, this is a contentious point. Obviously, the anti-dumping agreement is designed to provide relief from imports which are deemed unfair. But dumping alone is not sufficient to demand anti-dumping relief. In order to claim anti-dumping relief, the domestic industry in the importing country should have suffered a material injury. In other words, the three elements needed for satisfying a claim for anti-dumping relief include dumping, material injury and a causal link between the two. Dumping remedies in the nature of anti-dumping relief predated even the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Canada had implemented a legislation almost a hundred years ago. Australia, South Africa and the United States had domestic legislation to deal with dumping even in 1921, long before 1947 when the GATT entered into force. The economic rationale for anti-dumping was to address international price discrimination which was injurious to certain domestic industries. GATT 1947 was the first international agreement that sought to regulate dumping. Article 6 of the General Agreement or the GATT provided as follows. The contracting parties recognized that dumping by which products of one country are introduced into the commerce of another country at less than normal value of the products should be condemned if it causes or threatens material injury to an established industry in the territory of a contracting party or materially retards the establishment of the domestic industry. So although Article 6 of the GATT provided the legal basis for the initiation of anti dumping actions, this provision was not detailed enough. Specific agreements for example, the Kennedy anti dumping Code and the Tokyo anti dumping Code were negotiated later, I mean subsequent to 1947 to provide additional disciplines for the conduct of anti-dumping investigations. However, not all GATT contracting parties were signatories to the anti-dumping code. The most comprehensive agreement to address dumping was signed during the Uruguay round of trade negotiation that happened between 1986 and 1994. The agreement is known as the agreement for the implementation of article 6 of the general agreement. As the name of the agreement suggests, it provides additional substantive and procedural disciplines on the implementation of Article 6 of the GATT. The anti-dumping agreement which was concluded at the Uruguay round clarifies and expands Article 6 and the two operate together. In other words, the WTO members can counteract the effects of dumping only through the remedies specified under Article 6 of the GATT and the Anti-Dumping Agreement. In other words, Article 6 of the GATT as well as the Anti-Dumping Agreement operate together and also limit the permissible responses against dumping. As of now, the permissible responses to dumping include definitive anti-dumping duties, provisional measures and price undertaking. In fact, there was a dispute uh, before the WTO, popularly known as the Bird Dispute, where the panel and the appellate body reiterated the close connection between Article 6 of the GATT and the Anti Dumping Agreement. By definition, dumping means selling a product at a price below the normal value. The normal value is the price of the product under investigation in the home market of the exporting country. However, 
the antidemic agreement allows an investigating authority to disregard the actual price in the home market in one of the following situation situation number one there are no sales of the like product in the ordinary course of trade situation number two a proper comparison cannot be made because of the particular market situation or the low volume of sales in the exporting country the alternative method is to consider the third country price of the product or to use the so called constructed normal value furthermore there is an obligation on the investigating authority to exclude the sales made outside the ordinary course of trade in the normal value calculation interestingly the antidemic agreement does not define the term ordinary course of trade although the term ordinary course of trade or OCT is not defined in the antidemic agreement it alludes to the situation of below cost dumping for example if the unit price of a particular product is less than the unit cost of production which includes both the fixed and variable cost and a certain amount of selling general and administrative expenses it may be inferred that such sales are not in the ordinary course of trade even when the price at which the goods are sold happen to be below the unit cost at the time of sale if that price was above the weighted average per unit cost of production for the period of investigation then it must be assumed that the cost incurred was a recoverable within the reasonable period of time such below cost sales cannot be ignored in order for all the domestic sales to be considered to be part of the transaction at least 80% of the total domestic sales ought to be made at a profit that is a price above the cost of production and the selling expenses in case 80% of the sales are in above cost only those sales which are above cost can be considered as part of the normal value calculation if the sales are not in the ordinary course of trade the most commonly followed methodology is to determine the normal value on a constructed basis the cost of constructed normal value is actually based upon the factors of production in the exporting country therefore one could easily state that not all below cost sales are ignored in antidemic investigation the antidemic agreement admits the possibility of making certain loss making sales during certain periods of a normal business cycle the concept of ordinary course of trade is also employed to deal with situations where the exporter has insignificant volume of sales in the exporting country if domestic sales are made to related parties the domestic investigating authority should examine whether the domestic price were affected by relationship between the two parties in the case of non market economies such as china or vietnam most antidumping authorities use the non market economy methodology for the determination of normal value the basic assumption is that in view of the predominant intervention or involvement of the government with respect to resource allocation and output the domestic price and the cost data in those countries may not be reliable and if they are not reliable they are actually ignored for the purpose of normal value calculation in such a scenario the antidumping agencies calculate the normal value on the basis of factors of production based on surrogate country prices for example a third country investigating authority could treat china as paraguay and take the cost of production details from a company situated in paraguay as discussed a, a few moments ago every antidumping investigating authority takes into account the normal value and the export price for comparison purposes the comparisons are to be made between the normal value and the export price for a particular period of investigation the export price in relation to a product under investigation means the price of the product exported from the exporting country or territory 
to, to the country taking the antidumping investigation. Assuming that the normal value and the export price have been fairly determined, the investigating authority will have to establish whether dumping exists or not. To this effect, the investigating authority must proceed and perform a fair comparison between the normal value and the export price. Article 2.4 of the anti dumping Agreement also require Article 2.4 of the anti dumping Agreement also requires the, import, the importance of the so-called apple to apple comparison. To this effect, the normal value and the export price should be at the same level of trade, for example, at the X factory level. The X factory prices are assessed after making numerous adjustments. This includes taxes, discounts and rebates actually granted and directly related to the sales concerned, packaging costs, costs related to export and transportation of the product, cost charge for the product's entry into the country, etc. The antidemy agreement includes three methods that could be used by an investigating authority for establishing a dumping margin. The most commonly used methodology is to compare the weighted average normal value with the weighted average export price during the period of investigation. Comparisons on normal value and export price can also be made on a transaction to transaction basis. There is also a third methodology whereby the weighted average normal value can be compared to prices of individual export transactions. The last methodology which is weighted average to transaction price is used in exceptional circumstances when the two other comparison methodologies are inappropriate. This methodology is meant to address targeted dumping, namely dumping that is targeted to certain enterprises, regions or to certain time periods. In many ways, the devil is indeed in the details with respect to the comparison. Now introduce you to a concept called zeroing. One of the most controversial topics in dumping margin calculation is the issue of zeroing. This is a matter that was taken up before the WTO panel and the appellate body on numerous occasions. Some of you might have heard about the case of EC Bedlinen. This was a case brought by India against the European community in the WTO way back in 2001. Zeroing is a methodology whereby the investigating authority treats as zero negative dumping margins <coughs> to calculate the overall dumping calculation. Such a practice leads to inflation of dumping margins or finding a dumping when it doesn't exist. The impact of zeroing is that it eliminates negative dumping margins from overall dumping margin calculation. In such a case, dumping will look more serious than it actually is. One of the most crucial issues in the conduct of an anti-dumping investigation is the selection of the like product. The like product is actually the product that is manufactured by the domestic industry and that is very similar or identical to the product exported by the subject countries. So the most important issue is how the like product can be determined. Article 2.6 of the anti dumping Agreement defines like product to mean a product identical or having characteristics closely resembling the product under issue. The investigating authorities are given a wide scope and discretion with regard to the determination of what is actually like under Article 2.6 of the anti dumping Agreement. The product scope in an anti dumping investigation is generally very narrow. To give an illustration of an anti dumping investigation involving ceramic tiles, the product scope is determined as follows. It says, the anti dumping investigation on ceramic glazed tiles other than vitrified tiles, where at least one of the sides length or width exceeds 17 inches, that is 431.80 millimeters, or it is actually 1.4167 feet long. So these goods are used for as covering for walls and floors in the buildings. The product is classified under customs 
on the customs tariff heading 6908-9090. Another important pillar of the anti-dumping investigation is the need to determine injury because the dumping should have affected the economic condition of the domestic producers in the importing country. The injury determination requires an evaluation of the impact of dumping on the domestic industry. The domestic industry is actually defined as the domestic producers who manufacture or produce the like product which is actually the subject matter of the investigation. Article 3 of the Antidemy Agreement provides for injury and causal link determination. So the most important concept is that the Antidemy Agreement has classified injury to mean one of the following concepts. One is actually material injury. It means a genuine injury suffered by the domestic industry. The second is threat of material injury, which is a genuine threat of injury suffered, not yet suffered by the domestic industry, but there is a reasonable likelihood that the domestic industry is facing a threat of injury. Then the third is material retardation. It is a situation where the domestic industry is about to, is about to be established, but its establishment is materially retarded because of imports. Once the industry has been established, the domestic producers forming part of the new industry cannot rely on the meaning of this term since injury has to be established like in the case of material injury. The Antidemy Agreement provides guidance on the determination of material injury and threat of material injury, but it provides no further guidance on the consideration of factors for the determination of material retardation of the establishment of the domestic industry. When you look at the material injury factors, Article 3.4 of the Antidemy Agreement provides a list of 15 factors. These include sales, output, productivity, capacity utilization, magnitude of marginal dumping, inventories, wages, ability to raise capital, profit, market share, return on investment, factors affecting domestic prices, actual and potential negative effects on cash flow, employment, growth and any other factor. These factors actually include economic and non-economic factors. Then the important thing in an antidemic investigation is the consideration of volume and price effect. Article 3.2 of the Antidemic Agreement provides that an investigating authority shall consider whether there has been a significant increase in dumped imports in either absolute or relative terms with respect to production or consumption of the product in the importing country. Article 3.2 of the Antidemic Agreement also speaks about price effect. Article 3.2 says that there a domestic investigating authority will have to consider whether there has been a significant price undercutting by dumped imports, whether the effect of such imports is otherwise to depress prices to a significant degree or prevent price increases which otherwise would have occurred to a significant degree. Article 3.2 of the Antidemic Agreement points out that none or several of these fa factors could provide decisive guidance with respect to the material injury. Article 3.5 of the Antidemic Agreement imposes an obligation on the investigating authority to find out whether the dumped imports through the effect of dumping are set forth in, a, in Article 3.2 and 3.4 of the Antidemic Agreement are causing injury within the meaning of the Antidemic Agreement. The basic purpose of this provision is to, is to make sure that the imports are actually causing injury to the domestic industry. There could be several factors which at the same time may be causing injury to the domestic industry. And there is another requirement to conduct a non-attribution analysis. So according to Article 3.5, there is an obligation on the investigating authority to ensure that the injury is really attributed to the dumped imports and that the injury is not attributable to any other factors other than dumped imports. So this is called the non-attribution requirement. An investigating authority needs to separate 
the effects of other factors and ensure that the material injury could be attributed to dumping alone. An indicated list of other factors mentioned in Article 3.5 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement includes the volume and price of imports not sold at dump prices, contraction in demand or changes in the pattern of consumption, trade restrictive practices of and competition between the foreign and the domestic producers, developments in the technology and export performance and productivity of the domestic industry. So this is an extremely important obligation. Some academicians actually argued that this kind of a non-attribution can be conducted only through a quantitative analysis, but evidence suggests that most of the investigating authorities, mainly in developing countries and even in some of the developed jurisdictions, are actually conducting a quantitative analysis in order to determine that the effect of other factors is not attributed to the dumped imports. Once an anti-dumping investigation has carried out dumping, injury and material, dumping, material injury and causal link, the anti-dumping duties can be recommended. A number of WTO members impose a duty which is actually equivalent to the marginal dumping. Some other countries actually impose a duty called the injury margin. So members such as India and the European Union impose a lesser duty rule. According to the lesser duty rule, the lesser of the dumping or injury margin which is sufficient to offset the injury can be imposed by the importing country. The second important issue is as to who can file an anti-dumping or CBD petition. Dumping affects the domestic producers of the like product manufacturing that product in the importing country. However, not everyone can actually file an anti-dumping investigation. The anti-dumping agreement imposes a requirement to conduct a standing test and according to the standing requirement only manufacturers, producers or wholesalers of the live product can actually file a case before the domestic authority. In certain situations, trade associations, coalitions or other unions can actually file a case on behalf of the domestic industry. The second important requirement is that the petition must be filed by or on behalf of the domestic industry and according to this requirement, the petition should actually get the support of 25% of the total domestic production of the like product and there is an additional requirement of 50%. 50% of those either expressing an opinion should support the domestic industry standing. The anti-dumping agreement also requires certain kind of negligibility thresholds. If the imports from a particular subject country is less than 3% of the total imports, then the anti-dumping authority should actually terminate investigation against that country, unless the authority aggregate imports from all other countries which fall below this 3% 3, 3 level threshold. Likewise, if dumping margin is less than 2%, no duty can be imposed against the com company concerned. The investigation includes a period of investigation as well as an injury investigation period. The purpose of the period of investigation is to get the sales and cost data from the companies who are actually exporting the product to the country taking the investigation. The period of investigation generally varies from 6 months to 15 months. In ordinary cases, it is, appear, it is considered to be one year. The injury investigation period, on the other hand, includes the period of investigation and the three previous years. There are separate agencies that actually conduct the dumping investigation and the injury investigation. In certain countries, including the United States and Canada, the dumping and injury investigation are conducted by separate agencies. For instance, the U.S. Department of Commerce conducts the dumping investigation in the United States, whereas the Department of the International Trade Commission conducts the injury investigation. But in countries like India and the European Union, the dumping and the injury investigation are actually conducted by the same authority. There are also certain requirements with respect to notification and publication of information. The initiation of the investigation is generally conducted through 
gets a notification. Interested parties actually get the public versions of the petitions and the exporters and interested parties are given questionnaire which need to be filled up and submitted to the authority within time. Once the information has been given to the authority, there is a verification of the data submitted by the producers and exporters. So once the verification of the producers and exporters are conducted, the authority will have to disclose the finding. There are two stages in the anti-dumping investigation. One is basically the provisional finding and the second is a final finding. There are also certain procedural rights involved in an anti-dumping investigation. The exporters are generally given a 30-day period in order to furnish questionnaire responses. Extensions are given in certain rare situations, but generally the time limits will have to be scrupulously followed. All interested parties actually get full rights to defend their interest. They also get the right to present their oral arguments and the authority has got an obligation to provide timely opportunity to make sure that the information is available on the public records. The anti-dumping remedy consists of additional tariff equal to the amount of injurious dumping. A number of countries as I mentioned earlier impose a duty which is equivalent to the marginal dumping. Whereas on the other hand, countries including the European Union and India actually enforce the lesser duty rule. The United States on the other hand doesn't impose, uh, the, doesn't practice the lesser duty rule. Alternatively, the exporters can seek price undertakings on assurance of selling above a particular reference price. The normal duration of an anti-dumping duty is 5 years and at the end of the 5 year period the duty shall expire. But the domestic industry can file a petition seeking the extension of duties beyond the 5 year period. Then the domestic authority can extend it subject to a finding whether the repeal of the measures would be likely to lead to an increased volume of dumped or subsidized exports or to a resumption of dumped or injurious exports. The anti-dumping investigations are slightly different from safeguard investigations in the sense that there is only a requirement to prove material injury while safeguard investigations require a serious injury standard. But generally anti-dumping remedies are fairly helpful to the domestic industry to get back to competitive levels. And the anti-dumping remedies are quite frequently used by developing countries. India is one of the largest users of this particular remedy. Other important users include Brazil, China, European Union, United States and Argentina. A number of WTO members have actually become strategic users of anti-dumping remedies. India is the largest user of anti-dumping remedies. A number of other developing countries including Brazil, China, Argentina, Mexico also impose a large number of anti-dumping actions. Other countries include the European Union, United States, Canada and Australia. These remedies have got an extremely important use in terms of putting the industry in those countries back to competitive levels. Thank you.